Hello everyone and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Monday, May 10th, 2021. On today's episode of the show, we're going to be talking about the latest film and TV news. My name is Ben Pearson. I'm the senior writer at SlashFilm.com and I'm joined on today's episode by Slash Film writers, Pai Chan Bui. Hey everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hello. Well, guys, it's Monday and uh, what a good day for the Hollywood Foreign Press Association to start uh, experiencing some consequences for its actions. So uh, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about what's going on with the Golden Globes. Um, you know, I, I feel like everybody who listens to the pos- who listens to this podcast probably knows our stance on the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, which is a very, very small insular group of quote unquote journalists. Um, who are, it's very mysterious who their membership are, uh, you know, who, who is in the, their membership. And they're the people who vote on and hand out the Golden Globes. They, they're a nonprofit organization. And uh, basically they've been, there's been sort of a stink around them for many, many years. But this year, finally, that stink has has become something that people can no longer tolerate thanks to some reporting from the Los Angeles Times and just several um, instances of just massive self-owns on the, the HFPA's part. Um, in recent months, we've learned that there are zero black members in the organization, which is obviously not great. Uh, and they, you know, there are all sorts of things we talked about on previous episodes of this podcast where like they were flown out to the set of Emily in Paris and put up in fancy hotels and just all sorts of um, behavior that is not uh, consistent with (laughs) what you should be doing as a, as a real journalist. So uh, there's been this sort of wave of backlash against the Hollywood foreign press association. And that has taken a new turn today because NBC has said that they will not be airing the 2022 golden globes show, which is um, I think maybe the first real big step in terms of there being like actual consequences for this organization and what's going on here. So in the past couple of weeks, they have announced like, Oh, we're going to do better. We, we plan to do this and this and take these steps to try to improve things or whatever. But uh, in terms of um, uh, this, this report from variety says that NBC executives were concerned that the HFPA has not set a timeline for these changes. And the network had seen no movement on how it might rethink its membership goals um, so basically all of their sort of posturing about, oh, we're going to do better, um, was not given a, uh, you know, a, a proper timeline. It, 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 understandably people are a little wary of this organization and just taking them at their word that they're going to do better is not good enough right now. So NBC has said, Hey, guess what? We're not showing the golden globes next year. Um, I have some questions about this, including like whether or not this means NBC is going to have to pay the $60 million a year that they uh, have, I guess, in their contract to uh, the the organization. Are they still going to have to pay that? Is there some sort of clause in that contract that will allow NBC to not have to pay that huge chunk of money to this organization? Will some other network step in to broadcast the show instead of NBC? Um HT Chris, what do you guys think about this? HT, let's let's start with you. Do you do you think uh, some other network might step in and and sort of fill this gap? I hope not, because I think that the HFPA deserves to see the consequences of their actions and their actions being inaction in terms of representation and diversity and actually, you know, being upholding ethics in terms of movie journalism and and, uh, critical acclaim and awards and those kind of things. So it would be very a very bad move on any network's part if they were to step in and air the Golden Globes uh, because this is obviously NBC trying to make a statement of of sort of to try to draw the line there. Mm -hmm. And um, I do wonder if they're going to replace it with another awards ceremony, maybe like Critics' Choice or something or one that doesn't get as much primetime coverage. Uh, even a guild award or something like that would maybe take the place. My my big fear is that it would be something like the People's Choice Awards or something. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's it's a good move on their part. I think um, it would be in bad taste for any network to step in and, and uh, offer to air the Golden Globes instead. Yeah, I agree. Unless it's like somebody who is actively courting you know, like, uh, it's like Fox news or something like, I, I don't know. Um, it seems like somebody would be like, 
there, there may be a, a place there, but that, that seems to open up a whole can of worms that I definitely don't want to open. So, um, Chris, what do you think about this? What, is there any chance that the Golden Globes just don't happen in 2022? Or do you think that they're going to try to, the membership is going to try to scramble to sort of put these things in place on a, a fast track and maybe like convince NBC to air it anyway? What do you think is going to happen here? Boy, I hope they don't come back. What they should do is reboot the show Double Dare and all the nominees have to run through the Double Dare obstacle course. And the, the winner is the one who wins the, the award. You don't have to call it the Golden, call it like the Double Dare Awards. And they have to like reach up into that big nose and get the flag. And then just give me that. I, I'll watch that. You know, like Tom Cruise sliding down the slide, putting his hand up the the big nose. Remember Double Dare? Yes. I do. Yes. Uh, well, speaking of Tom Cruise, he's actually uh, returning the three Golden Globe Awards that he's won from the organization over the years. And uh, Warner Media, Netflix, and Amazon have all cut ties with the HFPA. So I think, you know, there there is a wave that is building here of, uh, of uh, backlash that is bigger than just people talking. It seems now that that actual action is being taken. So um, we'll track this obviously and, and see, you know, if we can figure out the answers to some of these questions. I'm very curious to see what happens with that $60 million that's sort of hanging in the balance there. And if that's just going to get tied up in courts for the next couple of years or, or what actually happens there. So uh, in the meantime, let's go to the, our next news story, which involves Cinemark signing a deal with five major Hollywood studios. HG, tell me about that. Yeah, so a couple months ago, or six months ago rather, Cinemark had struck a deal with Universal to uh, basically shorten the theatrical window, uh, which is the time uh, in which a theatrical release is um, required to be in theaters before it can move on to home video, PVOD, digital, and streaming release. And uh, Cinemark is expanding beyond Universal and striking deals with Warner Brothers, Disney, Paramount Pictures, and Sony Pictures Entertainment uh, for deals that we haven't been uh, revealed the details yet. Um, but considering the previous pact with Universal, it will likely be, pertain to that theatrical window and perhaps shorten the theatrical window overall for all of these, all the releases from these studios. Uh, for Universal's pact, for a reminder, it was um, the uh, theatrical window has been, is limited to now 17 days. Uh, in, after which they can move to premium video on demand platforms. But uh, this bars box office hits that can bring in more than 50 million. So we can probably expect just um, theatrical windows in general to to start shrinking because uh, maybe this is the way that that uh, exhibition, a theatrical exhibition uh, and movie theaters manage to keep afloat versus dying altogether. Yeah, I was wondering what you thought about that, HG, if this is just... You know, because I think in the beginning of the pandemic, when these deals were being uh, struck, I feel like all of us were sort of like, well, these are kind of temporary things. You know, these are these are Band-Aid situations. We're obviously in uh, unprecedented waters here. But now, you know, this this deal was just struck like last week. And we're kind of thankfully in this country a little bit better off than we, you know, than we had been certainly. And vaccines are rolling out and all of that. So, um, yeah, do you think that this like, I guess you kind of just answered the question, but do you think this really is going to be like the new normal? Do you think that all these exhibitors are going to have to sign individual deals with these studios and try to, um, you know, keep that that window uh, as small as it has been over the past year? I think it might be. I mean, Cinemark certainly is setting a precedent and it's a very game-changing precedent at that. But it should be noted that Cinemark is the third largest exhibitor in the U.S. after AMC and Regal. So that while they make an impact, it won't be as impactful if, as if AMC and Regal were to make these kind of deals too. But um, I do think it's a um, a better option than movie theaters dying altogether, like people have been saying since the mm-hmm. start of the pandemic and since before the pandemic. Like the pandemic certainly accelerated these things, but um, I think that it will probably change the face of movie going, uh, but not kill it altogether. So I don't, I think that, yeah, the shortened theatrical window uh, is a way for these theaters to to manage to stay afloat. And I don't think that it's it necessarily equates to the end of theaters altogether. Yeah, it's just going to be a big change, certainly on, on their end. 
Um, all right, our next story involves, well, kind of uh, it is related to uh, exhibition because it involves A Quiet Place Part Two, which uh, John Krasinski and, uh, is the writer and director of that movie, and Emily Blunt, his wife, is the star of this film. And these two are evidently in a battle with Paramount over the uh, their paydays for this sequel. And this conversation reminds me a lot of what happened when uh, Warner Media announced that um, all of Warner Brothers 2021 movies would be uh, streaming day and date on HBO Max. And the, all this decision was made without the input of all of the stars and directors and, and filmmakers and people involved with those films. Um, and it sort of caught Hollywood by surprise. And a lot of people, including big name uh, actors and, and you know performers and stuff, were, were not thrilled about uh, about that news. So the studio ended up having to renegotiate a lot of the contracts there and and pay people out um, because these actors and and uh, writers and directors often have in their contracts bonuses built in based on the um, amount of money that a movie makes at the, the box office and Paramount uh, just launched its Paramount Plus streaming service not too long ago the, the rebranded CBS All Access and they announced that uh, all of its new movies will be streaming on Paramount Plus just 45 days after they debut in theaters. And Krasinski and Blunt, who have been patiently waiting for A Quiet Place Part 2 to come out, it was going to come out right around the time that the pandemic hit in 2020. Uh, that movie, instead of being you know released uh, on VOD anytime over the past year, has been one of those films that Paramount thinks that it can make a lot of money on. So they've held it until, uh, I think it comes out later this month, yeah, May 28th. Um, so yeah, the, basically Krasinski and Blunt are saying, hey, this 45 day thing, uh, this movie is going to be streaming on Paramount Plus. That's going to cut off a lot of our revenue streams in terms of, uh, or in terms of like how much money this movie can make. Um, Bloomberg says there are tens of millions of dollars at stake based on, you know, what the language of their contracts and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, Paramount has so far rebuffed their efforts to obtain compensation that would sort of approximate how the film might perform under better circumstances. Um, Paramount has also turned down Michael Bay. Uh, he put in a request for more money too, because Bay is one of the producers on this movie. So uh, yeah, we, I mean, like I said, with the whole Warner Brothers scenario, that studio ended up having to renegotiate and, and sort of pay out a lot of its the people who were involved in in the movies that uh, you know were, were impacted by their decision. So I'm guessing Paramount is probably going to have to do something similar. I'm very curious also if this is a, a precedent setting decision on Paramount's part, because Paramount also has uh, two very big movies coming out soon in Mission Impossible 7 and Top Gun Maverick, which both involve Tom Cruise. And he probably is going to want the best deal possible uh, for him too. So uh, I imagine he has similar box office milestones, um, you know, worked into his contract and, and the same sort of thing that's happening with Krasinski and Blunt is probably going to end up having to happen with him. So, uh, yeah, just more sort of, um, uh, tumult in, in the, the film industry right now. Um, speaking of tumultuous nonsense, HT Venom, let there be carnage, uh, put out a trailer today. Um, I have not seen the first Venom. Uh, HT, have you seen the first Venom yet? I have not seen the first Venom either. <laughs> Okay, Chris, have you seen it? I sure have. Okay, I was hoping that at least one person on this episode would have seen it. So, uh, Chris, I actually want to go to you first since you have seen this movie. What did you make of the trailer for Venom Let There Be Carnage? You know, I really liked this trailer. I like that it's leaning into how silly all of this is because I feel like the trailers for the, the first movie were like, look at how fucking dark and serious venom is and then the movie itself wasn't dark and serious it was actually kind of funny just because tom hardy's just really going for it and i feel like they learned their lesson they were like you know what let's just play up the fact that this is a really silly film franchise <laughs> and i just i really you know i don't think it's going to be like a fucking you know classic or anything like that <laughs> but i had more fun watching this trailer than i did for a lot of other superhero movie trailers like at least they're trying something fun here and not just like trying to fit it into a, like a you know the marvel formula where i feel like everything sort of just is starting to look the same and blend together hopefully that's going to change because i feel like the upcoming marvel stuff is a lot different but for a long period of time there we were in this period where every marvel trailer looked 
like exactly the same to me. And I like that this looks like a weird, goofy. <laughs> it's like a buddy comedy, basically, where Tom Hardy and Venom are just like bullshitting their way through a movie. And also Woody Harrelson is there doing. I don't even know what he's doing, but he's clearly having fun. So I'm I'm all in on Venom. Let there be carnage. Everything about this appeals to me. The dumbness, the title. I'm in. Well, Chris, it's interesting that you said the first uh, movie's trailer sort of made it seem like, oh, Venom, I'm so dark, whatever. And and like that was kind of the, I mean, certainly the tone is much lighter in this trailer, but like visually speaking, I had trouble seeing what was going on in this trailer. It seemed lit very poorly to me. What, do you disagree about that? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, um, maybe a little bit, but I'm... I'm very curious about this because uh, it's got a new director. It's got Andy Serkis is directing it. And um, uh, who's doing that? I think uh, Robert Richardson is doing the cinematography and Roger. Oh my Robert God. Richardson. Are you serious? Yeah. He, and he's a, he's a fucking legend. So I'm sure even if these, these shots look dark to you, there's gotta be more to it uh, than the, you know, what you see. <laughs> okay. Uh, AC did writing about this trailer, uh, convince you that hey i should probably watch this first venom movie or is this something where you're like all right i get it i'm out on this whole thing no you know it kind of did because the only thing i know about the first venom is that it was all right except for the lobster scene in which tom hardy gets into a lobster tank um, because because you know for reasons i don't really know i don't know the reasons um but i know that people adored that scene it made our our best moments of 2018 list i think jacob Mm -hmm. really went hard on arguing for that scene and um after watching this trailer it feels like they doubled down on kind of the absurd comedic beats of that lobster scene and um made it into the entirety of, of venom let there be carnage like the the dinner the scene in which um venom makes breakfast for eddie while he just mopily sips on orange juice takes up like 80 percent of the trailer and i thought that was hilarious and the scene itself really really funny so i was like you know maybe i'll watch it for this okay yeah i'm curious what people out there think because i have not uh really been on social media much today i haven't not seen like what the reaction is for this so if you're like a big fan of the first venom and you have thoughts about this i would love for you guys to email us and let us know even if you've never seen the first venom and let me know if this is something that uh, has piqued your interest enough to maybe convince you to go back and watch the first film just send us your venom let there be carnage trailer thoughts i'd, I'd love to read them um all right choose so let's carnage move. oh yes choose carnage indeed <laughs> um chris tell me a little bit about uh, our next story here which involves a remake of faces of death yeah, it's it's more of a reimagining. I know these terms get thrown around a lot. Remake and reboot and reimagining. And I feel like reimagining fits best here. So for those who don't know, I feel like everyone will know this, even if they haven't seen it. But uh, back in the, the good old days of video stores, there were there was a series called Faces of Death. Uh, and they made six of them, <laughs> believe it or not. And um, they started in the 80s. And... Uh, it was sold basically as uh, a documentary that showed real deaths, basically a snuff film, if you will. And the thing is almost, I don't want to say all of it, but a large portion of it was fake. Uh, it was like done with, with makeup effects and stuff like that. That said there, there is like real stuff in here. Like there's like crime scene footage of like a car accident and stuff like that. And, Mm. So it's like, it's mostly fake stuff. Like there's a, there's like the most infamous thing is there's a guy being electrocuted in an electric chair and like his eyes start bleeding and all that stuff. But that's, that's fake. That was not a real thing. And so like the majority of this movie was fake, but that didn't matter because they sold it as, you know, real death. And that sort of made it infamous. It made this, this cult underground thing. And as I said, it spawned a bunch of sequels and now, uh, somehow Hollywood is taking this idea and making it into a feature film. And I actually kind of think uh, the story they've come up with here is, is kind of interesting. Um, it's that the film will quote revolve around a female moderator of a YouTube like website whose job is to weed out offensive and violent content and who herself is recovering from a serious trauma that stumbles across a group that is recreating the murders from the original film. But in the story, 
prime for the digital age, an age of online misinformation, the question faced is, are the murders real or fake? And I kind of like that that's sort of like a, uh, almost like a J horror movie, like the ring and one miss call and pulse like that, that plot line of like, you know, technology and, and finding something on the internet and wondering if it's real, that, that, that sort of fits with that era when there were, were a lot of these horror movies where everything was like revolving around the internet or phones and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I kind of think, you know, that's kind of a neat idea overall. So I'm, I'm, uh morbidly curious about this that's weird because like on one hand it sort of feels like a quaint notion like you're saying sort of like a throwback to a a style of movie that doesn't get made very much anymore but on the other hand it also feels weirdly uh relevant because there is so much like this synopsis said like misinformation out there and like the idea of uh videos being altered and all that kind of stuff like it you know that's only getting worse um so yeah it's like this weird middle ground of being like a something that that feels uh at once um you know a throwback and also of the moment so yeah um so who's going to be involved in making this new version are you familiar with their work at all uh it's it's this team um isa mazzy and daniel goldhaber and i'm sorry if i said their names wrong uh they made a movie called cam which i will confess i did not really like but uh, that's currently on Netflix if you want to watch it. It's about uh, it's a horror movie about a uh, a cam girl, uh, and I tried to get into it. I really did not care for it. But that said, I'm still interested in how this shakes out. Okay, all right. Our last uh, news item for today involves a sequel to Killer Clowns from Outer Space. If you guys have not seen the original movie that came out in 1988. It is uh, sort of the definition of a, a cult film. It's like a pure cult movie that has an extremely personal touch. It's very low budget. Um, it's really goofy and there are crazy prosthetics and costume effects. And it's about these, uh, these clowns that just show up and set up a circus tent in a small town and start turning people into cotton candy or something. It's a very, very weird movie. Um, HG, have you ever seen killer clowns from outer space by any chance? I can't say I have. Okay, Chris, I, I'm guessing you've seen this, right? Oh yeah, this was a this was like one of those movies I used to watch like all the time as a kid. <laughs> it was just so much fun. It definitely is one of those movies that I think is best seen when you're a kid because it, it just operates on like s- sort of like a um, I don't know if visceral is the is the right word, but it operates on this plane of existence that you just sort of like let it the whole thing wash over you. You can't really think about the logic of it too hard, but it it also is. Um, it's a movie that is, well, this is going to sound really stupid because all movies involve images, but it is a movie that just seems uh, all about the images, really. Like, it's not so much about the story. It's just about these, like, um, iconic may seem too wrong, too too strong of a term, but, like, just these weird frames and the, the, the bizarre characters that appear within them. Um, it's a really, really strange movie. And Like I said, it came out in 1988, and pretty much ever since then, people have been sort of clamoring for a sequel. This is definitely a cult film. It doesn't have like a huge audience, but I think, you know, in in that era of VHS tapes that Chris was just talking about for um, where Faces of Death sort of became a cult film, uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space became a cult film in that same era, but in a sort of a different corner of, um, you know, the, the blockbuster movie rental store experience. And uh, Steven Chiodo, who directed the original, has been trying to get a sequel made for yeah, like th- you know, thirty plus years now. And a few years ago, it was announced that Sci-Fi was going to be making this sequel, but uh, that never ended up happening. And in a recent interview, Steven Chiodo talked about why that version never really basically came together he said there was a deal mgm controls the rights they went to sci-fi um sci-fi made uh, 2019's critters attack and you saw that and what that turned out to be like but they wanted to do clowns for like two million dollars and we didn't want to do that we did it for two million back in the 80s so we didn't want to do it even mgm didn't want to do it they said it was a more valuable property than just signing off for that little money um so when this came out uh jacob in our slack channel was like basically said that it was insulting that the studio wanted to give them the same amount of money that they had in 1988 because typically for sequels your your budget goes way up um 
So, uh, Chris, as the only other person here who's seen <laughs> this movie, uh, are you glad that Killer Clowns Two uh, never happened, or, or what, what, what's your um, what's your take on whether or not you even want to see a sequel to this weird little movie? You know, I feel like if they had made a series of direct to video sequels immediately after the first one, that would be great. But it feels like uh, I feel like you can never recapture the the goofball magic of that first film. And I, it's, so I'm, I'm kind of glad that it stands on its own. And I just have a feeling like no sequel would ever be as uh, entertaining as that. Because where do you go? There you already yeah. got their killer clean house matter space. You can't really do much more with that. I guess you could like send humans to the, the clown planet. I don't mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, all right. Now that I said that, I kind of want to see that. So <laughs> someone make that movie where they go to the clown planet. <laughs> Oh man. All right. Yeah. Uh, HT has any of what we said here um, intrigued you enough to be curious about this? I mean, I know of killer clowns of, from outer space through pop culture osmosis, I guess. And you can't really forget a title like that. So I've always been like, oh, I should watch that probably, but I never did. So, you know, if they make a sequel that's send people to the clown planet, then sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get into the mailbag real quick. Just a, a, a one piece of uh, feedback from uh, Carl from Canada, who was listening to our recent conversation about a black Superman casting and wanted to toss in a few thoughts here. He says, I breathed a huge sigh of relief when Michael B. Jordan said that he wasn't going to play the role. I love the guy as an actor, but to play Superman, somebody needs to be able to be the coolest guy in the room, while to play Clark Kent, they need to be uh, able to be the least cool guy in the room. I honestly can't see Michael B. Jordan doing the latter. That's why I also can't get behind guys like Aldous Hodge. Big and tough and cool can only go so far. Brad's suggestion of uh, Rene Jean Page made the most sense to me, but I think one of our bigger rising stars in the moment would fit the type that I see able to play the role, Kingsley Benadir. I know he's been cast in Secret Invasion at Marvel, but uh, tons of actors cross the Marvel DC aisle. Definitely somebody I can imagine as a feeble reporter one moment and as the ultimate hero the next. So I just wanted to toss this out to you guys. Um, I know we were throwing out our own casting suggestions and stuff. What do you guys think about Kingsley Benadir in, in a world where, you know, this, you know, somebody snaps their fingers and this happens. Uh, Chris, what do you think about this? Yeah, that is good casting. I wish I had thought of it. He was really good as um, Malcolm X in uh shit. What was it called? One night, one in night Miami. Miami. Yes. I yes. forgot it for a minute, but that, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he was really good. That's like the only thing I really know him for, but he was really good in that. So uh, yeah, this is a good choice. What do you think, HC? Yeah, he was, for me, the standout of One Night in Miami. He was so, so good. And um, Malcolm X is such a hard character to portray, too. But he lent it almost like a warmth and complexity that I really enjoyed watching. So in a just world, Kingsley Benadire would be cast in everything. So I'm all down for it. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you to Carl from Canada for that. And uh, if you guys want to send us any other feedback, questions, comments, concerns, mailbag topics, or responses to anything that we've said here, you can send those to peter at slashfilm.com. And I think that's going to bring us to the end of today's episode of Slash Film Daily. You can find more about all the stories that we mentioned on today's show at slashfilm.com and linked inside the show notes of this episode. This show is published every weekday, bringing you the most exciting news from the world of movies and TV, as well as deeper dives into the great features you can find on the site. You can subscribe on Apple, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Tell your friends, spread the word. Thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you tomorrow.